1 Timothy, say amen if you're there. It's the first chapter, so it's the easy one to find. Well, we're going to read two verses, 18 and 19. If you're there, say amen. All right. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Now you know you're in trouble when your mentor lets you know life's going to be a fight. You're hearing me. <clears throat> he goes on. Now I'm interrupting a conversation here, so it, it, at first it's not going to make sense, but it, it will one day. Holding faith. Now trust me. We think faith is a religious word, and it is, but we just don't hold it for religious things. Some of you have more faith in your car than you do God. Some people have more faith in their job than they do God. There are some people out there that hold their notoriety or their their, their famous status symbol. In, you hear what I'm saying? Okay. My war, good war for. Holding faith and a good conscience. Here you go. Clear conscience. Clear. Oh. <laughs> Y'all been to that place when it wasn't clear? You get that sick feeling in your stomach? Boss is about to show back up. Mom's coming home. Dad's coming. But listen what he's talking about because he's talking to a young man who's got his whole life ahead of him. Which some having put away concerning the faith, have made shipwreck. Where y'all been, man? I don't even care what's right or wrong. I'm not putting it away. I don't care what's right. I don't care what's wrong. I want to do what I want to do. And he's instruct, Paul's instructing this guy, listen, God gave you a conscience for a reason. He doesn't want you to be a shipwreck. There's a lot of nautical terms in the word of God. In fact, later in one place, it talks about any time I left him slip, which actually talks about when a, a, a boat or a ship losing its mooring to the dock and it slips away and, and gets pushed downstream and destroyed because there's no one at the helm. Now I'm going to go to John chapter 10, verses 10 and 11. John's a great book. And we'll be talking a little bit more about him here <coughs> in, in a minute. <coughs> I've read this a lot lately. Uh, I even used it in my text, but I want to. John chapter 10, 10 and 11. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, let me explain something here. God wants you to have a good life. God wants to be able to bless you. But understand it's still your choice as to how he can bless you. It's up to you. Does that make sense? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Lord, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and definitely your grace. God, we're going to talk about a subject today, God. There's going to be some things that are detailed, difficult, sometimes hard to face. But God, I pray that you allow me in words that will be easily entreated, understood. That, Lord, it may speak encouragement and bring a resurrection of faith and life into each and every one of us in this world that is getting so dark. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. My father liked ships. It's kind of funny because even though he liked ships, he wasn't a good swimmer. I found this out as a teenager when just a week prior to his, to his untimely death, we were, he was trying to recover. Come on, parents. We try to recover time with our kids. They get older. You're like, where did the time go? So uh, we already had one sister that had went in a tailspin and uh, was actually living in another country. And uh, things were going. And so my mom and my dad was trying to grasp at the last few moments they had with me 
and my younger sister, uh, Christina, which some of you met. She was here a month or so ago. And hopefully she's in tune. Hi, hi sis. Anyway. Um, so we go to Lake Berryessa, which is California. Yeah, I've been redeemed. I'm out of California. I got my life right. Anyway. <laughs> oh, sorry. I got people in California watching. Anyway. So we go to Lake and spend time there. Well, you know, here I am, a young teenage guy, just kind of feeling out a little bit. And I've been wrestling with my dad my whole life. And all of a sudden, you know, we're out in the water. And I didn't realize that my, my mom and dad were very, very pushy in us learning to swim. They wanted us to learn to swim. And I didn't realize it was because of my dad's fear of drowning. And I'm going to get a bunch of stories in here. There was one time he got in an inner tube as a kid. And he had floated away from shore because he fell asleep in his inner tube. And he woke up and he was like farther from shore than anybody else. And he started screaming out for someone to come get him. And they were yelling at him. And he couldn't decipher what they were yelling at him. Because he was yelling. And finally, he stopped yelling long enough to hear what they were saying. They said, stand up! And the water was only <laughs> waist deep. But he had that fear. So anyway, I'm wrestling with my daughter, my, my, my dad, and Lake Berryessa. And we're wrestling around. And, you know, I kind of got the advantage on it because, like he said, he wants to learn some. I passed lifeguard. I was, a, I was certified lifeguard at age 11. They four, I remember going to this. I barely remember the first time going to the swimming pool. I was just a little kid. That's just how they did us. They wanted to make sure we knew how to swim because my dad had this fear. So I'm wrestling with my dad and I got the advantage on him. And all of a sudden he got this freaked out look on his face. But it wasn't him that yelled. My mom started giving me the what for from the beach. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and later it was explained to me what was going on. So anyway, he introduced me to sailing ships and, and all sorts of uh, uh, boats and stuff like that. He loved them. He, he literally had plans to build his own sailboat it's pretty cool so anyway i actually have in my library one of his favorite books on ships in fact the story i'm going to talk about here is found within those pages and uh it's actually a, a national geographic special edition written by captain alan villiers not that you all want to know that but you do anyway and so it's a remarkable story of a tremendous warship called the vasa that's not it in the picture that's not that's just a cool picture that I found I decided to use. In the opening paragraph of the story, it says, a truly proud moment, a fine day, this Sunday afternoon, August 1628. Milling spectators wave and shout gay good wishes, you can tell it's a long time ago, on the quay before the royal palace in Stockholm as seamen warp their country's mightiest warship out into the harbor. Vasa. Named for the royal family has begun her maiden voyage. At that time, Sweden was locked into what was called the 30-year war. And they were glad to finally get this 1,400-ton galleon to her navy. This ship had great big giant bronze cannons on it. And they were ready to roar an appropriate reply to German emperor's threat of invasion. It's always the Germans. She's not going to look at me. There were sailors perched high in the mast, up in the rigging, breaking out the light small sails as the Vasa moved along easily. Years of tremendous labor. Acres of the very best of hardwood was used to build this wartime masterpiece. And when the work was finally finished, the majestic Vasa sailed from the shipyard. It was more than just a boat. It was a floating work of art, a weapon of war, a picture of strength and power with a striking beauty and majesty decorated with intricate art detail. There's really nothing more tragic in ancient times than the horror of a shipwreck. The Swedish warship Vasa on her maiden voyage. 
in 1628, on her way out of the harbor, less than one nautical mile from the shipyard. <laughs> this great ship, an ode to the Swedish king who ruled Scandinavia in early 17th century. He had actually ordered four great warships new to patrol the Baltic Sea. And none of the other three were as mighty as this ship. The king himself dedicated the Vasa. It's a big deal. He ordered its measurements and had two gun decks that held 64 of those bronze cannons. And in the end, this master piece of triple laminated oaken walls that were 18 inches thick. The top mainsail mass soared 190 feet into the sky. The rudder stood over 30 feet. Carvings were etched in the bow and the high stern. Ornaments of kings, knights, warriors, cherubs, mermaids, all meant to scare the other ships, the enemies. It was a symbol of power and courage. It took years to build this ship. So when she finally set sail, this ship of unmatched splendor and majesty and raw strength made her way out to the cheers of the crowd. Proud royal onlookers. But it was only subtle. A breeze blew through, a squall erupted, and a small storm ruffled the waters, and it healed the Vasa suddenly to port. Surprised men up in the rigging braced themselves on slanting decks and waited for her to right herself. But something went wrong. She never came back. Robbed of her sailing grace, the gun ports had been left open from having fired her farewell salutes during the harbor passage. And the salty sea began cascading in, flooded the ship. She didn't sail for long. The pride of Gustavus Adolphus sank like a stone in 110 feet of water only about a hundred yards from the shore. Her masts, the points of her mast still visible, poking up above the surface of the water was a reminder of what had happened. This remarkable, beautiful vessel, the product of years of hard work, this, this ship that was to be the pride of the king's fleet now lay on the bottom of the ocean. I'm sure as other ships came in and out of that harbor over the years, they could see the out-of-place masts poking up out of the water. Finally, over the years, the masts eroded away and disappeared below the surface but the thought of all the potential, all the plans, the effort that had gone into building and preparing this great ship for a great task, all the masterful handiwork and artwork and all the everything that goes in sank and sat below the waves as a constant reminder of unfulfilled potential of what could have been. It was built to master the wind, cut through the sea. It was crafted to ride the waves. But one simple mistake, and it lay buried in the deep below the surface of the water. All oh, the battles that it was prepared for, that it could have won, the, the fights, the Voyages of adventure that might have been. The hopes and dreams of all the craftsmen 
are held captive in a watery grave of the deep. Hmm. Paul, in our opening text in his letter to 1 Timothy, makes an interesting statement that I hope will arrest your attention for a few moments today. He said, some have made shipwreck of their faith. Can I say it plain? They wrecked themselves because they didn't check themselves. <laughs> it's a clear word picture, shipwrecked. Shipwrecked faith. Faith that was once full of potential. A life uh, that was ready to go on and fulfill dreams and hopes. Uh, this ship represents those that had faith and potential, but now buried in a graveyard of the deep, sunken under a watery tomb. It's a descriptive statement of a life that once was full of faith and hope. The Vasa today, and for the sake of my story, represents one of the greatest tra tragedy of the ages. It represents lives that were made for some greater undertaking. Hearts called to greater challenges, to accomplish and to do and to succeed. Things, people, lives made for a higher purpose. Incredible people. There are some incredible people that have gotten shipwrecked, sidetracked along the way. Something's happened, perhaps a sudden shift or distraction or something has happened and they lay shipwrecked at the bottom of life. Sunken potential that could have been in the oceans of life. There are shipwrecks. It creates images of unfulfilled potential. Faith, hope that died an untimely death. What a tragedy. We've seen it. We know people. We struggle with it today. The question we must ask as we think about the tragedy of a shipwreck, how does one shipwreck their faith? How does one shipwreck their life? Paul answers the question and he, he gives us the people to see. He says they do it by rejecting a good conscience. Ships are built to master the sea. Barring some flaw in workmanship. Or, they, they're made to float. I mean, they're not fragile. They're not easily capsized. They're made out of wood. Last I checked, wood still floats. So what he's talking about here is that in most cases... For someone to make shipwreck, they merely just have to ignore some critical truths in order to wreck a ship. We know this all too well. We do. In fact, we, we, we title this entitled thing under one word with one ship with one name. We all know it, the Titanic. The sinking of the Titanic was probably... The greatest of all maritime tragedies. I mean, it is another ship sinking. We know sh ships have done this, but what makes this one so bad is not only was it not a cause of any wartime battle, the Titanic was a horrible loss of life, a loss of promise, a loss of hope. It is compounded by the fact that it was avoidable. <laughs> that's the tragedy. In fact, that's why we call something a tragedy. That didn't have to happen. On the day that the Titanic sank, she had been receiving wireless messages. In fact, all day long, warnings of icebergs in her path had been coming in. The first warning was received at 9 a.m. that morning. Others followed throughout the day. 
the key here isn't that there were messages, but that they were ignored. And so in the evening, as the warnings continued to come in, they had actually become so common that they just simply ignored the telegrams altogether. They weren't even passed on to the first officer anymore. And finally, at 11.40 p.m., almost 15 hours after the first warning was received, the imminent danger was realized. The reason for all those warnings had manifested itself in the form of, you guessed it, a great, big, giant, mass of ice, commonly known as an iceberg. Lookouts startled the officers to attention, screaming an alarming cry, Iceberg! 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 Did the tone and level of the declaration mean any more or less than the subtle telegrams? <laughs> you and I are all aware of the tragedy and the great loss of life, but what adds injury to insult is it was completely avoidable. It didn't have to happen. There was no reason for it to happen. I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings, but I li I icebergs aren't like Sasquatch. They're not like unicorns. Have you seen one? Uh, yeah. Google it. It's pretty common. There's a big mass of ice at the North and South Pole, and they're kind of common in certain waters. They were very common then. It was, oh, hello, McFly, are you hearing me? So in order for the Titanic, a ship that they deemed even God couldn't sink, in order for it to sink, just one simple thing had to happen. Ignore the warnings. Ignore good advice. Ignore good counsel. Disregard all the warnings you're given. That's what makes a tragedy. That's what makes a tragedy out of something that didn't have to happen. But they became so calloused to all the warnings. Oh, I've heard it before. I've been told it before. We don't need to listen. Okay, got it. Okay, I don't want to listen anymore. Other things became more important to the Titanic and those in charge. Image. Pride. Others' expectations. Self-grandizement. Headlines. The same is true for people that make shipwreck out of their life. The same is true for who make ship, people make sh shipwreck of their faith. When a good conscience is ignored. When you just simply ignore, you know you should do this. <laughs> when an individual ignores the warning signs, godly counsel, and chooses to speed through the treacherous waters of life. And anybody with any gray hair can say amen to that. We set ourselves up for unnecessary failure and shipwreck. God has equipped every person with a moral compass. We each have been given that inborn sense of right and wrong. It's something that all humanity holds in common. Here we go. Let's go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. Can, can we just kind of be honest? It's wrong to lie in every culture. Hello? <laughs> There's not some secret island. Hey, lion's okay over there. It's not there. It's wrong to steal in every country. It's wrong to cheat everywhere. Every society says it's wrong to kill. There's an inner sense of right and wrong that's built into all humanity. Even in the experience of sinful and fallen man in our fallen nature, there exists a level of conscience.
Even in the Old Testament, Adam and Eve automatically hid themselves from God in shame because of their conscience, past moral judgment on their disobedience and sin. They recognized what they had done is wrong, and they hid. Anybody ever hid before? Don't raise your hand. I don't want you to. Sadly, the conscience is not enough to save a person. And for that matter, it's not even enough to correct the course of a person's life. Because the conscience of humanity has been perverted by the fallen sinful nature of man. Paul goes on to tell Timothy in chapter 4 verse 2, Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. James backs up this sentiment in James 4, 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's a bad place when you can no longer discern or understand right from wrong. In fact... Hold on to your seats if you have to. Humanity has an unsightly word or term for those who cannot discern right from wrong. Are you ready? Anybody know what that word is? I even heard anybody whisper it. It's called a psychopath. Psychopaths have deficits in emotional processing and inhibitory control. They can inhibit. They engage in morally inappropriate behavior and, 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 and generally fail to distinguish moral from conventional violations. Now listen here, folks. Listen who's speaking. He is not the epitome of all that is good. When you realize who's speaking and you go to what he wrote in Romans chapter 7, it kind of lets you know, uh-oh, this guy's talking to Timothy. But look what he says over here in Romans 7 because... You might not want to mess with Paul on a bad day. Anybody knows who Paul was? He's saying something here. So I, I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, that's good, in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. He finishes it by saying, well, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Now, this is the same guy. We know Paul. He went from murdering Christians to being one of the greatest converts. We're going from a guy that didn't heed a conscience to a man. Not only heed a conscience, but now can help you with yours. You want to talk about saving a life. You want to talk about redeeming somebody. You want to talk about taking someone in the dreads of society and all of a sudden turning their life around. That ought to speak hope to every one of us when we start to realize, look what Jesus can do. What happened to this, this murderer, this killer? He, he went from murdering people to saving. I, I'll tell you right now, the Holy Ghost can change everything. In fact, it's so important in our world today that we get help from God because my conscience has been seared, it's been tortured, it's been tormented. I've been taught a lot of junk by what society says is okay. But the problem is, God's not coming to save a society, he's come to save a soul. In John, he says in John 16, 13, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he shall guide you into all truth. Right now, I'm glad I got a conscience, but I need the Holy Ghost. I need the Holy Ghost. I live in a world that is embraced in a seared conscience. We live in a world that, you know what, if you've been done wrong, do wrong back. <laughs> you feel justified. Come on, we feel justified. Slap me, I slap no. I I, I'm going to take it further. I'm punching you. I'm, I'm going for your eyes. I'm doing, yeah. Don't, it's not how we work. You cut me off. I'm going to cut you off and slam on my brakes. Oh, what? You, you, you're not going to do that in the house? Well, I'm not. I'm pretty. Can I get where we live and be real for a minute? It's going to end good. It's going to end good. Try, I promise. Stay with the ride. 
We live in a world that has embraced a seared conscience. We return evil for evil and then some. We're doing everything today in society that's wrong. And against, I'm you, we don't need another politician. We need a revival of church. We need a revival of Jesus. We're not going to turn it around by an idea. We're going to turn it about by the truth. And so I'm not here to point to the problem. I'm here to point to the solution. When you think about it, Saul was on a collision course for hell. You read about what he did to Stephen and you read about the papers he had in his hand to write to go and kill people. He's a wicked man. Seared conscience. He felt justified and right doing it because he had a piece of paper that said it was okay. He was going shipwreck with his eternal Saul. But what changed this murdering Saul into this Paul that we read about? In Acts chapter 9, here's Saul. It says in verse 1, you can go there in your textbook, which is your Bible. And it says in the King James Version, and then Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter. You know, here's a key. If you got a lot of threatenings and slaughter and bad stuff coming out of your mouth, eh, problem. Are you hearing me? Problem. Against the disciples of the Lord. Look, if you hate God's church, and you're talking against God's people. And you're hating people that are just trying to. There's something wrong with you. There's a spirit that's gotten a hold of you. You got a seared conscience. And you need to repent and get the Holy Ghost. And, and get renewed ASAP. Because you're on a collision course for a shipwreck. He went unto the high priest and desired them letters to Damascus. To the synagogues that if they found any of this way. Whether they were men or women. They didn't matter. We're killing everybody. That he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, listen, he came near to Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who are, who are you, Lord? Who are you? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Remember that word. We're going to hit that again. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, it's a question we all need to ask. What will you have me to do? If we could get back to that place of God, I got a seared conscience. What do you need me to do? What, what can I do to be saved? My conscience, I've seared it. I got problems with it. I don't always know right from wrong. I need to know what to do. And he said, arise and go into a city. And it shall be told thee what thou must do. We serve a loving God that's reaching into the life of a murderer. And wants to save this guy before it's too late. You, you, can, can we say God is so good? Oh, aren't you glad the same God that reached down into Saul's life is here right now? Can reach into your life and turn the whole thing around? To turn the mess around? And so here's God and Jesus starts dealing with this guy, Ananias. Ananias said, wait a minute, I know this guy. I don't want to go to him. Yeah. Oh, let me meddle. You know you don't want to go to that family member you wrong and say, I'm sorry. And you know you don't want that family member to come to your house because you. It's just easier not to talk for 30 years. It's just easier to walk around each other silent and don't it? Mm. It's a sad thing that Almighty God can have an ark built and put all those dumb animals on there and then not kill and eat and murder each other. And yet we got human beings with, a, with some gray matter up here, a few brain cells, and we can't get a lighting fires and burning and killing and are you hearing what I'm saying? Okay. In verse 17 of chapter 9 of Acts Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said brother <laughs> some of y'all need to get an email right there oh, are you your brother's keeper? Yes. 
Can you say yes? Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way that thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Listen, it's not just good enough to see because your conscience ain't going to do it all. You need the Holy Ghost. If you're going to get this right, if you're going to get over some things, if you're going to conquer some things that you've done or had done to you, if you're going to go, you're going to need something bigger than you. You're going to need something bigger than a pill that you get down there at the psychiatrist. You're going to need more than Redland. You're going to need a little bit more than a Xanax. You might need a little bit more than my at all. Whatever it is that floats your boat, you're going to need a little, you're going to need the Holy Ghost. You're going to need the Spirit of God in you. You're going to need something that can overcome the world. And so we got a man that was a murderer doing a 180. And we got a guy that didn't want to deal with this guy that was probably running from this guy doing a 180. God gives 180s. God changes things. That's what Jesus can do. And so, when you realize that Saul gets this turnaround, he gets a name change. Start calling him Paul. And you follow his life story. In Acts chapter 19, he's the one throwing a lifeline. He become from being the rescued to a rescuer. <laughs> Acts chapter 19, if you go there in your textbooks, verse 1, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. These are good Christian folks. And he said to them, now listen, you have to understand what's going on here. Your conscience is not enough. Just being a believer is not going to be enough. I'm going to tell you something right here. Right now. I know this is true because I need God to help me do what's right. Look, it ain't all angelic in my house. She may be an angel, but I'm not. I know you don't want to be admit to the thoughts that come in your mind and the things you think. Or Hello? But I tell you what, it's a battle for me still every day. Every day, I'm still the same guy that was, you don't need to know how long ago I was born, but anyway. <laughs> Hello? I still got memories and feelings and emotions and nostalgia and all this stuff that is cluttered and impairs my conscience. Paul says, listen guys, that's all good, but have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Paul's on to something because he realized, wait a minute, you're not going to make the 180 without help. You're not going to get your life turned around without help. You're going to need more than just easy believism. There's a lot of people out there believing God, but you wouldn't know about how they, how they live their lives. So we all know that believing ain't enough. And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said to them, unto then, what were you baptized? Because now this matters. And they said it unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, you know, I think the Holy Ghost is working here because he could say, well, that idiot. <laughs> See, because if it was me and I walked up on a job you were doing and you did it, I'm like, man, you idiot. Come on, man. But look, come on. We had a friend one time. We were having this dinner together. They were coming over. She was going to make chicken enchiladas and we were making some Spanish food and we were all getting together to eat. Now still, still pretty young at this time. We were just young couples. Our, baby, our babies were babies. And Rod and I are sitting there playing Madden. But this is Madden when it was like I mean it was like I mean Bo Jackson was in it. That's how long ago. Some of you don't even know who that is. But anyway. It's like Tech Mobile or something like it. It's ridiculous. Like it's classic. Now probably worth millions of dollars. But anyway. So we're sitting there playing. We started eating these enchiladas and all of a sudden Rod and I just look at each other. And it's, his wife made these, so I'm, I ain't saying nothing. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. Let's, let's keep one over here. And, and, he, and he just starts looking at me. Does this taste funny to you? And I wasn't going to say nothing. But So he goes, April, what kind of chicken did you put in these? And she goes, what? She reached down and takes a bite. 
spits them out. And I'm like, hallelujah, Jesus. Now they know I can't eat them. <laughs> so, 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 so I'm bailed out. But then she goes, well, I read the can. It said chicken of the sea. <laughs> That's the God's honest truth. She made tuna enchiladas. Ah, ah, Lord have mercy. Thank God for redemption. <laughs> eat those things, man. Woo! I was saved. Hallelujah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Well, stuff happens. If it had been me, I'd have been like, I ain't eating that trash. I'm not eating that. Thank God for Rod being honest. Yeah, you have had, I was an I evangelized for a while. I ate a few things. Oh, this is great. Oh, get me out of here, Jesus. I've been there. I've been there. <laughs> I, I, thank God when your wife makes things, say, honey, please don't make that again. <laughs> I, I'll just, I'll just make my own dinner tonight. You know how you do. Anyway, but, he, but, but listen to what he said, because Paul's on to something. He said, John barely baptized. He didn't kill the guy. He didn't just tear down the guy. He uplifted what he did right unto the baptism of repentance because repentance is important. But there's been a shift. There's been a change in, in things. And he's saying, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him. Another, Listen, there's something better coming. That is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they didn't argue. Can we quit arguing with what the Bible says? People want, man, brother, why don't you debate anymore? My conscience is seared. I just want to slap him and say, understand this, what thou readest? <laughs> Let me help you. I don't fight and argue no more. If you want to go believe something that's not in the Bible, I'm not going to fight with you. I'll give anybody a Bible study, but if you're going to argue for something that's not in, you know you won't find anybody baptized any other way than in Jesus' name in the Bible. I, I don't get people baptizing in titles. It says in Matthew 28, 19, it says in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, but the name is singular, so what's the name? If you need more on that, I'll, I'll see you after church. It takes me two minutes in your Bible to show you. And when they heard this, when they heard this, when they heard this, they argued with Paul for an hour. No. It says, and they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues. Why? They needed to do a 180. They needed more than their seared conscience. They needed the Holy Ghost. They needed a revelation. They needed something bigger than their shipwreck. I'm going somewhere. You stick around. It's important for all of us to seek the Holy Ghost. My conscience needs help. I can override it and still do something wrong. Tell the truth and shame the devil. It don't take much for you to change the decimal point to give yourself a little more than what the uncle's supposed to be getting. And all the taxpayers said amen. Mm -hmm. Our conscience needs help. Our families need the help of the Holy Ghost. Our relationships need the Holy Ghost interjected. Our world needs to be saved. And it's only by the Holy Ghost. All these ideas and great sermons that make you feel good. They're wonderful. But I still must be saved from the shipwreck. That is me. That is what I am. I need Jesus to resurrect me and change and alter my thinking, create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. I want to be that good guy that I know is there. Oh, but wretched man that I am. And God, when he fills you with the Holy Ghost, he renews and restores a God conscience in you, a restored consciousness of right and wrong. How does a guy go from a gun-toting drug dealer, drug addict, to a preacher? The Holy Ghost. And there's some other people in here can stand and testify of anybody in here been changed by the Holy Ghost. You ought to stand and give glory to God. I, I can testify for a while. I can testify and tell you what the Holy Ghost can do. It ain't just a few words and coming to an altar. I believe in Jesus Christ, my per person. Oh, no, no, no. I went down in the watery grave in his name. Received the Holy Ghost. Spoke in tongue. Why? I got the Holy Ghost. Fire in my life. Listen, the world wants to make mamsy pamsy 
weak Christianity the thing of the day. That would never have worked for me. Look, I'm sorry. I love you. I, I just... This stuff that I'm hearing on the radio, this stuff, there's, there's a few good things in there. I get it. I'm not discrediting none of it. But it's not complete. It's not complete. Remember, the Bible's a bad book. man. I don't know why some of y'all so caught up in the dumb, fake, fictitious movies of superheroes today. You're not reading it. If, like I am then. If you're caught up in all that and you can't wait for the next adventure, you're not reading this thing. How many know about the crazy naked madman in the Bible? You're not reading and knowing and understanding what God can do in real life for you. This ain't something, some fictitious thing that you go watch for two hours and pay way too much money for and way too much money for pathetic popcorn when you can get it right something even more amazing in the word of god mark chapter five and they came over to the other side of the sea into the country of the gadarenes and he was come out of the ship See, the bible's really nautical too so my title fits anyway immediately jesus is just stepping out of the boat it's on a nice sandy beach, you know. They got to break out the umbrella, ice chest, do a little fishing, maybe, you know, roast some cod on the I don't know, you know, whatever. But it says immediately, immediately they met a man out of, the, out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. <laughs> this, is, this is the scourge of the earth. This is a mess. This man who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him. No, not with chains. Because he had often been bound with fetters and chains. And the chains had been plucked asunder by him. This, this is a crazy guy. And neither could any man tame him. And we all got one of those in us. You don't care how right your husband is. You're going to. You don't even care how right your wife is. You. You don't care what the sign says. You don't care about the red and blues flashing behind you. Let God, I'm going to do what I want. We all got that guy in us. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, I know it, honey. I'm trying. And you know what the answer is? Okay, baby, but the Holy Ghost will help you. <laughs> Are you hearing me? And it says, and always night and day. This is a crazy man. This is a psychopath. He was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. I got a cure for the suicides in this country. Don't kill yourself. Let Jesus save you. But listen to this. So those of you that don't think you can come to an altar. And don't think that you can live for God. And don't think it might be too much to walk forward and, and repent and pray through and get the Holy Ghost. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him. Ah, nothing can stop you when you get in the presence of God. When you, when you finally find your salvation and you realize how good Jesus is, you don't care what anybody else thinks. He didn't care what anybody else thought. He, and Jesus surrounded by a bunch of religious folks. He didn't care. That dude was so messed up and so crazy. He didn't care what anybody thought. All he knew was that all of a sudden he was in the presence of the one that could fix his conscience, fix his problem, change his life, get him out of the grave and get him back into a life, resurrect him out of his mess. When you get an encounter with Jesus, it can turn your life around. It can fix your marriage. It can fix your mind. It can fix your heart. He can change things. You know what happened to this joker? Just a few verses down in Mark 5 and 15. These folks come to Jesus. They come. You know, it's Jesus. Anybody come to Jesus? 
and they see him. And you know, he's labeled by his past. Can I get an amen? amen? Label me by my past. Go ahead. Him that what was, everybody say was, was. possessed with the devil. Yes. Let me tell you, I'm going to say something's going to be controversial. Most people really don't need the medication they're prescribing. You don't, no, you need a good altar, a Holy Ghost, Jesus preaching church, and you need to repent, we'll cast that out of you, and you can be clothed in your right mind like this guy right here. Oh God, I'm really going to cause a problem. Hello, internet, get ready. The problem with our society is the love of money. You think I'm crazy? We all know that hydroxychloroquine, oh yeah, and I said it has been used for years but there's no money in the medical field for a cure they make the money in the treatment we don't want you to be cured we just want to keep treating you oh there there needs to be some people cured in here you can be cured of that Okay, we all know about NA and AA. You know what they say? Hi, my name is Steve and I'm an alcoholic. Come on. Yes. Been there, done that, got the t shirt, threw the coin away. Everybody know what I'm talking See, Jesus don't want you to say that. <laughs> I was. We're going to get into that. Listen. Y'all making me preach too long. Shame on you. Let me move on here. <laughs> and so they fought. Listen, they possessed the devil and had a legion. Even a legion couldn't stop him. Look at where he's, where he's at. Sitting. I like, and clothes. The world wants you to get naked. They, they, no shame out there no more. Get your clothes on, folks. Adam and Eve had to get their clothes on. Get your clothes on. Keep yourself. Keep yourself for your spouse. Restore the dignity. People say, oh, what, you are ashamed of your body? Oh, no, no, no. I don't want, my, I don't want to give in my, the world any part of me. It's for my spouse. Y'all remember that song? No, you don't. You're too young. Y'all remember that song, you old folks? Sheena Easton? Oh, God. For your eyes only? We need to restore that in the house of God. <laughs> Come on. Someone... No, can't. Right. Yeah, he's clothed and in his right mind, and now they're afraid. When God turned my life around, my family freaked out. They got afraid. What's happened to you? We like you better when you're dealing drugs. We like it better when you're running around with that gun in your car. We like it. They said it. They did it. I wasn't invited for Christmas anymore. Because every time I walk in, I started talking about church. I started talking about Jesus. I thought, because when you've been set free like that, you want everybody else to be set free like that. A legion of demons at the feet of Jesus. Set free from a legion. You want to get your mind right? Jesus can do it for you. One of the benefits of having the Spirit of God living in your life is that, that awareness of what it is to be in right standing with God. I'm thankful for that. I don't fear when a cop pulls me over and I, you know, I want to talk to him. Hey, yeah, I'm a chaplain. What's going on? I got nothing to worry about. You know, I don't want to do anything that, listen, I'm going to use the word here, grieves the Holy Ghost. I want everybody, I don't care how long you've been in church, to listen to this. I don't want to grieve the Holy Ghost. Anybody ever done something that grieved to somebody? Or you got someone that you knew their life was meant for more and they're wasting it. And oh God, I raised my child for better than that. Oh, they knew better that they knew to drive. They knew not to text. And drive. What a waste. But in the Bible, it talks about in Ephesians chapter four, verse 30 and grieve not the Holy spirit of God. See people think, Oh, I'm saved. I'm sealed. Oh no, no, no. The Holy ghost, the spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of, of redemption wow i should read the entire chapter 
4 of Ephesians. But I'm telling you, if you'll just go in there and, and home when you get home, Ephesians 4, 14 through 32, I'll pray God gives you a revelation because I don't want to keep you that long. The light of the Lord shines in our lives through the Holy Ghost. And it reveals to us things. The word shows us the way to live. That's why the Bible says to hide the word of God in your heart that you might not sin against him. It's the war like Paul was talking about of our conscience of doing right and facing the wrong. Because the Bible reads you as you read it. Or you hear what I'm saying? And it reveals stuff about our character. Come on, we all walked away. Man, I shouldn't have said that. How many times we wish we could reach out and grab those words and bring them back? Oh, go back at the over. I want some do-overs. And we learn that through our daily interaction with each other. It reveals the elements of ourselves that are not pleasing to God. It's so important to get the Holy Ghost because it will lead and guide you, like it says, into all truth. That's the power of a God-transformed conscience and the Holy Ghost. We don't like to admit the sin stuff in us. I was a new parent. My son was at most two years old, just beginning to learn. I remember walking around the corner. He was just the cutest little peanut. That's what we call him. Call him peanut. Turned into meatball pretty quick, but at this time it was peanut. Come walking around the corner, the corner to go into the kitchen, and he's standing there. And all of a sudden, I saw him put his hands behind his back. At two, who taught you that? <sighs> Barely two years old, and he's hiding something from me. What? What possibly could you do at two? That's so bad that he had to hide something from me. In all truth, the whole house was geared for him. It looked more like a playroom than a home. Every plug was plugged with those little things in case his little fluffy little finger. No, it was everything was made for him. Everything. There's toys and wagons and everything. He, he The day he was born, I bought him a tool set. It's what you do. I was all in his dad. It was baby proof, man. From baby proofing to baby food, the whole house was for his. He was the most important responsibility that I had. And in one moment, he stole and had my heart. My life and its existence was about providing for him. It was. What would he have to hide from me? A loving father, everything. I, it's your son. What, what do you need, buddy? What do you want? But like the rest of us. We're all born in sin and shaping in iniquity, the Bible says, and we're prone to sin. We're prone to fall, no matter how angelic and innocent, right? Let me say this. A church is not really a church if it makes you feel okay in your sin. I'm, I'm, I love you. I, I told someone today, I told Ezekiel, I said, listen, if this does this, let me know. We're going to have a problem with the audio going out being loud enough for all you wonderful folks out there. I said, if I do that, call me out on it. Let me know. I want to know if I'm doing wrong because I always want to do better. That's not just with this microphone. When I have arguments with Sister Crow, I said, no, if I'm wrong, I want to know. You can always tell when I know I'm right. I'll continue to argue. <laughs> but if I'm wrong, I got, okay, I, I ask him. I'm telling you right, I'll tell him, I'll tell him right. I told you, if I keep arguing, I know I'm right. Eric hasn't figured it out yet, but they're learning. If I'm wrong, I'll just tuck my tail and go hide. And, yeah, you're right. Get it over with quick. But if you're wrong, it's going to go on and on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? <laughs> So a church is not really a church if it tells you you're okay in your sin. Does Jesus want your best life? Yeah, but you only get that through him. What good is it to gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Though? They're not going to tell you that down the road, but it's true. Jesus came to save us from sin, not to condone it. And here I am looking at this tiny little blue-eyed boy. And he looks up at me. And I ask him, what do you have, Nathan? Nothing. 
you, you know, these little fluffy little che- nothing. Let me see what you got. And slowly, in those little tiny hands, are two cookies. I had to laugh because whenever I gave him cookies, he got them two at a time, so he knew the limit. <laughs> How awesome is that? He learned something. But we always seem to want to go around the Father. Ooh. Now, it's not the end of the world, right? Come on. Who hasn't taken cookies? My problem is taking cookies. My problem is taking the whole row. <laughs> I'm take that. Just give me the package. <laughs> That's my problem. Now. It's not the end of the way. It wasn't really. The, it wasn't the cookies really that bothered me. It was behind how we got the cookies because it's what it took. It's the risk that 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 this little beautiful little boy took to get the cookie that was meant for me. Let me get them for you because the container was on top of the refrigerator. So how does this, well, maybe this, he took a chair, slid it over, climbed up on the chair, climbed up on a counter, turned to the refrigerator, and pulled the container over, intricately took the lid off, took two, put the lid back on, pushed it back, set the cookies on the counter, got down onto the chair, Push the chair back, reach over, reach up, get the cookies, and come around face to face with dad. What if he'd fallen? What kind of father would I have been if he'd have fallen? It's not that I didn't instruct him. I always gave him cookies when he wanted his cookies. The problem is, is when we want something, God says, hold on. If you get that without me, it will hurt you. Are you hearing? Are you hearing the message in the message? So the kitchen was always off limits because of safety, not because we didn't want you to eat. We're not starving you. We have everything in there for you. And we're like that with God. And it's then that I realized from that moment to now, as, as a dad, as a person, as a preacher, as a pastor, that's in all of us. If I can go around God, what is it about us that we want to turn and I don't want nothing to do with God or people of the church or what I just want to, it's that seared conscience in us that we all tend to do something we know we're not supposed to. We take risks that can forever harm us and damage us. And like Paul said, we can make shipwrecks of our own lives. There's nothing worse than watching a wonderful person with great potential destroy their lives, to take their abilities and sink them in the issues of life and become a shipwreck. We, we, we've seen people with great possibilities and potential make bad decisions and choices and wreck their life. It doesn't matter if you're 70, 17, or 7. We all need restored back to God. We need the spirit of almighty God. It searches our thoughts and our intentions. It perceives our motives and knows our feelings. Come on, we all say, oh, you know me. I wouldn't do that. You lying dog. We all would do it if we could get away with it. Tell the truth. (coughs) I need the light of God to shine. In the inner person that I really am. So that I can really deal with the true, the true conditions of what I am. Because it is entirely possible to project an image. Even an image of holiness and righteousness on the outside. But have a heart that's filled with sin. Whether it be hate, unforgiveness, jealousy, malice. Insert your issue right here. Because we can fool those that look at our life from the outside. And you can lie to yourself. But you really can't fool yourself. You can't fool your conscience. Your conscience is always going to be there with you. You can sear it to where you can continue to do it. 
but deep down you know. Because God gave us that constant reminder that you know the difference between right and wrong. And sadly, it's not that cartoon depicted with an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other. Biblically, it's de depicted as a shipwreck of your faith. Paul said you've got to ignore that innate sense of right and wrong. And when you do that, you will shipwreck your faith. You will turn a deaf ear to the church. I don't need God. I don't need the Bible. I don't need the church. I don't need a preacher or a pastor. I don't need a parent. I don't need any authority. I'm a free will to do as I please. We've all done it. I don't care. I'm doing it anyway. And I remember as I went off the deep end as my father had been killed and my mom went off the deep end and I exited the home. And I became the devil on those streets. Despite all of that, we've all heard that still small voice warning and speaking to our heart even though we're in the middle of that mess. No one really intends to go shipwreck. <laughs> No one really wants to take your life like that great vessel Vasa and plunge it to the depths. Paul stated that in the process of making shipwreck, they did it by putting away, I don't want to hear what's right. I don't want to be told what's good. You got someone in your life that's struggling with right. I'm telling you right now, they've put away. They put away. I don't want to hear. I don't want to do it. I want to do something else. That Greek word is translated by the King James Version that put away conveys a strong meaning to thrust away. To reject, it involves a deliberate, active, and forceful ignoring of the conscience. It literally means to push away and forcibly reject. Listen when I tell you, in order to shipwreck, you will have to force your way. <clears throat> it's harder to shipwreck than it is to float. <laughs> you will have forced your way past a good conscience that God has placed in you. Listen, the Holy Ghost ain't going to let you go without a fight. God ain't letting anybody go without. He said, I would that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance. You aren't going to accidentally stumble in the shipwreck. Oh, what happened? No. If you shipwreck your life, if you eternally destroy your soul, it will be because you, just like those in charge of the Titanic, ignore the warnings that your heart is broadcasting to you ignoring all the warnings and the good advice the, the fact that you, every time you walk past the Bible, every time you hear the word of God, hear the name of God, it will be because you rejected the pleading of a good conscience and a good call opening a, a door to whosoever will it's a dangerous thing to ignore your conscience I know I've done it because the more you ignore it, the more comfortable you become about ignoring so understand in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Paul speaks of those who have their conscience seared. That word seared means to cauterize. Y'all yeah. done? Everybody touch a stove before? <laughs> kind of like a cauterize. You burn the flesh. It, it can scar over and the burned area loses its sensitivity. The nerves are damaged by the burn. And it, it, it overcomes the wound with scar tissue that diminishes the ability to feel. That's what happens when you constantly ignore, constantly reject, constantly refuse to do what's right. Pretty soon, you sear your conscience. You become hard. Listen, don't let yourself get in the habit of ignoring your conscience. Don't ignore right and wrong. What seems like a small thing in the beginning will result in a large thing 
in the end. God gave each and every one of us a conscience for a reason. It's there to protect you. When you ignore it and reject it, you place yourself on a direct trajectory route of shipwreck. And like the Titanic, when you willfully sail into waters that can damage your soul over time, if you aren't careful, that final warning will come. That, that, that alarm will sound. Your, your conscience will capitulate to your carnal desires. You will strike that object and you will quickly sink. The tra tragic, tragic evidence of a shipwreck is the empty shell of a person years later. They forget their dreams. They let go of the potential. We've seen and we've viewed them, those, those, those people who were once great vessels of God, people that could have done wonderful things, but now they've fallen by the wayside and are characterized by lives of sin. We've all done it. We've all asked the question, what went wrong? We've all driven by that, that person that's homeless. What did, what did they do? Why? I talked about it the last time we, I was preaching. We all looked on the, on our, our, in our, in our yearbooks. Where are they? Oh, what happened? They were valedictorian. Years ago, I was an assistant pastor in the church, and we had a valedictorian living in the church storage room. The guy was smart. The guy was good looking. The guy had the world by the tail, but he didn't realize. As he seared his conscience, he thought his superiority was enough to get him by, but pretty soon he found himself begging for food, living in a storeroom of our church. Where do you miss it? How do people end up in such a state? They had all the promise and potential. Let me answer the question for you as I get ready to close today. It started with small, seemingly insignificant decisions to ignore their conscience. They would push it away. They didn't want conviction. They ignored that still, small voice. They ignored the advice of elders and authority. That's how you shipwreck your life, your faith. You need to thank God today for your conscience. Thank God that I know right from wrong. Has anybody ever done something to you? Hey, what are you doing? Because you know what's wrong? That's your conscience. That's how we know. We all have it. Let someone take a bigger piece of pie than you. Hey, wait a minute. That's not fair. Because we know. Right? Wait a minute. They got to watch what they wanted to watch. Now it's my... You know. Quit acting like you don't know. You know. You know it's there. It works. It makes things livable. The voice of conviction that speaks to our heart. Some of us likely need to repent to God for the times we've ignored not only our conscience, but it's still a small voice. We need to let our spiritual eyes to be open today. So that we can get a good view of the damage that is done every time we overrode our conscience and the voice of God. Now I know you're here in church today, but each and every one of us has places, wounds, scars. And if you're honest today, you can probably think of times and places where you've ignored your conscience. It's easy to remember when somebody ignored their conscience and hurt us. Those are easy, but it's when we ignored our conscience and hurt somebody else. You know your heart wasn't right. All oh, this time will be okay. But in your heart of hearts, you knew you were violating your conscience. I want to sound a warning today. It's a dangerous thing to reject the voice of God and the conscience and your conscience. But this is what I wanted to talk about. All that to say this. Believe it or not, there is a place where shipwreck does not have to be the end of the story. 
after 333 years in the deep. In 1956, the Vasa was found by a man by the name of Anders Franzen, a Swedish marine technician, an amateur naval archaeologist. And so in 1961, that wonderful, fantastic, amazing warship was lifted from her watery grave. But listen to this. How did it survive under the water all those years? The very water that sank it saved it. Because the salinity in that water was to a point that the, the those boar worms that get in and, and, and devour them under the water could not exist there. And so against all odds, and I say this to everyone, I say this all the time, defy the odds. In fact, I want you to turn your ear and say, defy the odds. If it's your wife, say, baby, defy the odds. If it's your husband, say, baby, defy the odds. And so they, 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 oh, it's back. They were able to locate it. It's an interesting story. It's an amazing story how he, he took this he took this metal with like a, a, a pendulum and would drop it in water, would sink really fast, and it had an open hole at the front that it would grab whatever it is. And all years he was trying to keep pulling up mud, but he finally pulled up black wood. And he knew that oak turned to black in a certain period in the water. And so when they found it, they did all the excavating around it. They did everything they could and they lifted. <laughs> they lifted. See, after 30 years, they had already forgotten where it happened. See, they may have forgotten about you. The world may have counted you out. Your own family may have written you off. Oh, that's they're gone a long time ago. We, but thank God for someone that comes looking. Thank God for a savior that'll come walking down your messed up road in life. Say, uh -uh, I'm not done. I can do what the world can't do. I can resurrect the life. I can take that shattered brokenness and restore it and put it back better than ever. That's what God does. It took six years. Now get my picture back up there. Come on, man. Put a wreck back up there. I'm still training them, folks. In all honesty, when you do the research behind the Vasa, what's amazing, the ship that was built to save them years ago is saving them financially today. It is their number one tourist attraction the story I like the story I'm preaching about it it took them six years to raise her from the ocean floor and to bring her to dry dock and 30 years of intense restoration and I like that he's not done restoring me. That's right. Amen. he's still working on me in fact she did not make it to general public viewing until 1990 and now today Thousands of visitors walk her decks each year. Shipwreck doesn't have to be the end of the story. A shipwreck is not the end of the story. There exists hope today. There exists an answer for sin today. Paul declared that Christ Jesus gave himself a ransom for all. Say that's me. He is the resurrection and the life. John said in 11.25, he said, under, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were shipwrecked, though he were dead, though it looked over, yet shall he live. I have found that Jesus walks in. 
when everyone else seems to walk out. He's not afraid of the mess. He's not afraid of the sin. He's bigger than that. He's got the answer. He's got the cure. You don't have to walk around saying, I'm this. Uh uh. I'm blood bought. I've been resurrected. It's covered by the blood. I don't, you don't have to know me by that. You don't have to know me by that. David's repentance is so beautiful. He had sinned. He killed the man. He sinned against God. He committed adultery. He had made a mess. But if you read his, if you want to know what his repentance is, he, his repentance is in the Bible. You find it in Psalms chapter 51. If you read that in verse 10, he makes the statement. Because it ain't over, Brother Lawrence. He says, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. What's he saying? I can get a new conscience. I can get a new, I can be a new me. I can be a new me. I can be a new me. Let's all stand. Listen. I like it when you get excited and jump it down, but I'm going to read something to you. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, Paul, and he knows a little bit, he knows a thing or two. Look what he says. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's, are you ready for the ugly part of this verse? Be not deceived. He's going to get into an ugly list here. And we're all in here. I'm in here. You're in here. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And the Bible goes on. Says, and such were some of you. But he didn't stop there. Because he says, he gives us the answer, but ye are washed. <laughs> ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What are you saying, Paul? I'm telling you, repent, get baptized in Jesus' name, and I'll wash it all away, and you'll be new. I'll resurrect you out of that shipwreck life, and I'll set you back to sailing on to victory. He goes on and says, therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You can be restored. You can be made new. That's what the church is for. You know why I come every time the doors are open? Because I always need a little bit more work done. I always need something else. I, I need a tune-up. I need my, the, my, my tires checked and my oil checked. I, hello, I need constant maintenance. I can be restored, but I need constant maintenance. Uh, hallelujah. That simple act of repentance. Each of us must learn the power of repentance. Because when Peter, when Peter was speaking, do you realize he was speaking to a bunch of murderers in Acts chapter 2? He told them, Peter, speaking to those guilty of the crucified Christ, these murderers, these liars, they asked, what can we do to be saved? You just told us, you condemned us, we're shipwrecked, it's too late, We've already, we're already guilty, we did it, we crucified him. The ship is sunk. And if anybody knew what that repentant was, Peter said that, wait a minute guys, let all the house of Israel Assuredly no. That God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified. One of the greatest liberating things you can ever do is admit, you know what? I got some junk in the trunk. I, I'm guilty. Both Lord and Christ. Now listen, now when they heard, I told you to remember a word. Now when they heard this, they were. I hope your conscience is pricked this morning. Because if it's pricked and your vessel has been sunk, you want to know how to get it back out? Peter said, 
to the rest of the apostles when they said remember what peter said and repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the what the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the holy ghost i'm talking about resurrected i'm talking about redemption i'm talking reaching down and grabbing people out of the bottom of the ocean of sin and raising them up and setting them on display it ain't over shipwreck is not the end we serve a resurrecting power god a healing god a saving god a life changing god life is a process there's an ebb and flow, there's an up and down, there's a, a constant changing. And it makes it very difficult for us to stay level. We kind of rise and drop with the tide. Over the years, that two-year-old has grown up. A couple of days, he turns 30. He was probably about... 19 or 20 we had one of our many fallings out because I don't know what it is about us but we're all young young men we think that we in order to be a man we have to put away with the man I don't want to hear from the man don't talk hello and my mother happened to be I happened to have her at my house in, in Midland and we were she'd come to visit and I just fixed us some lunch. And I didn't know it, but for about 30 to 45 minutes, Chris, that little meatball son of mine had been sitting out in front of my house. I didn't know it. Broke, hungry, wondering if he could come in the house. You got to be careful when you act like a jerk when you leave. It makes it harder to come back. But he didn't know. I'm not going to hold none of that. It's that subtle little knock at the door. You know, being minister, you know, most of the time people, especially in the event of cell phones, call before they come just to make sure it's not a waste of trip. Open the door, there stands my emaciated little son. Comes in. It was a great little family reunion with mom and son and grandson there. I kid you not. He was even afraid to ask for something to eat. That might be partially my fault. I have no problem taking the blame. I am not perfect. If you, I'm one of those guys, if I lay in front of you, you don't do it. Yeah, you're kind of dumb. I mean, don't hurt your feelings, but hello, if it's raining, you don't want to get wet, come inside. But anyway, so he wanted to get something to eat. We just got to eat. I said, yeah, everything in there is yours. And if I remember right, I think he was in about third, his third or fourth sandwich before you slowed down. I said all that to say this. God's door is just as open for you and I as mine was to my son. And everything in that house that he needed to get back where he needed to be was his too. We serve a God like that. That loves us, forgives us. He doesn't want none of us at the bottom to live a shipwrecked life. He's come because he is the resurrection and the life. Don't ever run from church. Run to the church. The devil's a liar. When you walk in here, I don't care what's going on. We'll embrace you. We'll love you. Now, like a parent, we'll still correct you and preach the truth and expect you to wise up and move on forward. Amen. We'll never know you by your past because we want to call you by your future. Amen.